You're watching The Heart of GAFCON on The Pastor's Heart. My name is David Old. Uh, we're brought to you by Anglican Aid, who are supporting more than 140 projects in over 40 countries doing aid, development, Bible training. And you can find out how to support this very important work by going to their website, anglicanaid.org.au. AU. I'm joined now by the Reverend Dr. Stephen Knoll. I think it's fair to say uh, that you've been one of the most influential voices in the conservative theological space within Anglicanism in the past 20 years. You were a uh, member of the st statement writing group for the past three GAFCONs, including the original one uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, most recently, you've written this thesis on the path forward for the Anglican Communion. When we were chatting beforehand, I think you called yourself a historical or even a, a, a veteran uh, member of this movement. Uh, Stephen, welcome to uh, the heart of GAFCON. What's it been like to be with you? What's it been like to be part of this movement over the last 20 years or so? Well, it's a privilege, but also a sense of a calling from God. I didn't go looking for this, and yet it seemed like I got thrown into the middle of these affairs and have been there for really even back to the Lambeth Conference in 1998, which I attended. So when I've used the word for myself and historical, it's a term that I learned in Uganda for what they would call a, an alumnus or an old boy or girl or, or a veteran yeah. of the movement. You certainly are, and that's why it's a real treat and really helpful for us to be talking to you today. Now, now remind us uh, back in 2008 when we had the first uh, GAFCON, what was that all about? What precipitated uh, a whole bunch of not only bishops but clergy and laity from all around the Anglican Communion going, look, we need to meet together at this moment? Well, I think it was literally a decade since Lambeth Conference uh, in, in uh, 1998 had put out the Resolution 110 on human sexuality that led to a, a decade of conflict within the Anglican Communion and basically an unsatisfying result because the Episcopal Church and Anglican Church of Canada continued to ordain homosexual clergy and perform same-sex blessings and they were basically unrebuked and undisciplined by the so-called instruments of, of, of uh, unity, namely the Archbishop of Canterbury. So that I think led leaders in the Global South who had been primates like Peter Akinola to feel that it was need to have an alternative conference to the Lambeth Conference in order to express the voice, particularly of the Global South, but in fact of Orthodox Anglicans everywhere. Yeah. And so you were involved in, in that first conference and you were part of the Statement Writing Committee yes. uh, there and they produced the Jerusalem Declaration and the statement that went with it. What was, what was it like being part of that uh, historic moment in Anglicanism? Well, again, it was a privilege and uh, one that I remember very clearly. Um, the statement group didn't come in with a pre-written statement. We had been instructed by Archbishop Akinola to listen to the con convention or to the assembly. And so throughout that time, we were getting, we were taking surveys, we were asking uh, what they thought. And one of the things early on, we asked two questions as people came in. One is, do you want GAFCON to do something? And the other is, do you intend to leave the Anglican Communion? And the answer to the first one was an emphatic yes, and the answer to the second one was an emphatic no. And so in some ways that kind of shaped the nature of the Jerusalem Statement and Declaration. And of course that debate has been had ever since and we keep being accused of wanting to leave but actually we're, we're not going anywhere, we just want to solidify things. Now, it looks bad in 2008. Now here we are in 2023, and I think uh, it's fair to say we're in an even worse state. In fact, we've probably, the crisis has now come to a head. Uh, just remind us again, what's the, what's the real presenting issue here at this moment as we meet together? Well, as I say, the presenting issue some people think is about sex. And I would say yes and no. I do think the issue of our time in political culture and the church culture has to do with human nature. God created man in his own image, male and female, and a man shall leave his father and mother and, and join to his wife. That's fundamental biblical teaching, and it's been disputed in our secular society and also in the churches. And that has just increased since 2008. 
And now we've come to the point where the Church of England is proposing blessings for people in same-sex relationships, indeed in same-sex marriages. That's claiming their doctrine of marriage hasn't changed, but effectively they are, they are, they are blessing it. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has said that he joyfully uh, receives this new movement. Just to help us understand, for those that don't quite see why that is now just a crystallizing moment, help us understand why that is this significant breaking point now. Well, in 2008, uh, the Jerusalem statement said that it respected the historic role of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Church of England, the Mother Church, but that its primary identity was not the Church and its uh, instruments, its government, but was its, its Reformation principles, authority of Scripture. And this particular issue is one that it seems to be quite clear, as 1998 said, it is you know, incompatible with Scripture other than to have marriage or uh, abstinence. So now the Church of England, which was a little ambiguous in 2008, seems to have come out of the closet, as it were, fully as the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada do. So that has taken the crisis to a new level. And what's the significance of the fact that the Archbishop of Canterbury is supportive of this? Well, he has been called the, the focus of unity um, as one of the in instruments of communion. Um, and, uh, but in order to do that, he also has to express the faith of the Anglican Church as it's written in its own formularies. And so I think both his political role in England and the Church of England, uh, and perhaps his attempt to keep everybody together has led him to say some things that are just very ambivalent and unclear, and frankly sometimes almost seem duplicitous. And so if he's meant to be the guy bringing us all together, it's now, it's now hard to see how, how he can do that. Now, uh, in this space, many people suggest different ways forward and things that could be done. And of course, uh, recently you wrote your own theses on the path forward for the Anglican Communion. Now, that's quite a detailed document, so we obviously don't have time to pour through it. But what's the, what's the essence of what you are suggesting as one way forward? Right. Well, I did in these 14 theses that I began to develop last year, uh, I tried to kind of sketch what I would call a providential history from the original crisis to the GAFCON response to sort of where do we go from here. And I think that's where we are now, uh, you know, in 2023. Uh, and I also noted that there had been two uh, movements within the Global South, uh, the, represented by the Global South Fellowship and the GAFCON movement. And I, I, the image I used was of a dual carriageway. I said, these two groups are, are moving along the same direction but in different lanes at the moment, whereas the other people are moving in the opposite direction in different lanes. And for me, what I'm hoping will happen is that the two lanes will converge more and more into one unified movement. And there has been that sense, hasn't there? I mean, as, as things have progressively got worse, we get different statements from GAFCON on the Global South, but, but recently, with obviously with what happened at the Church of England, the Global South have come out with an extraordinarily strong uh, response uh, uh, to that. And it does seem that the, those vehicles are, if you like, they're closer than ever together, aren't they? I hope so. I really do. Um, I think uh, I've been proposing, I wrote a book uh, three years ago called The Global Anglican Communion. And my, I guess my dramatic thesis in, at the end of my 14 was that now's the time for the formation of a new global Anglican Communion, which is not directly part of the historic or official Anglican Communion. And, and part of that perhaps might be a, a tighter coming together of GAFCON and the Global South. And, and I know I hear some anticipation around me leading up to this conference that that is one of the things that may, that may happen. I mean, we don't know, but I'm sure by the end of the week we'll get clarity on that. Now, of course, part of that uh, movement is the writing of another statement by the end of this uh, conference. Now, sadly, uh, you're, you're not on that this time. You've served us so well over the past three conferences, uh, as you say, a, a veteran historical historian historical member, uh, and now there, there is a statement writing group that are putting together what we might say is almost as significant or maybe more even important than the original 2008 statement, given the critical moment uh, that we're at. What sort of things will do you think that statement writing group will be grappling with? Really, I don't know, and I, I certainly, as I say, I'm not speaking now as anyone in authority, uh, but I, have, I do know that uh, in all the other groups we've taken very seriously. 
uh, the theological character of the movement, and it's also its historic plain placement at this moment. So I really don't want to say too much more than that, except that I, I do hope that this conference will be one more step forward for this movement to come together uh, and be promoting the global Anglican future, which is what we started to do in 2008. That's great. Now, you're giving one of the plenary sessions tomorrow yes. morning. Uh, wh what is that going to be covering? Well, uh, actually, I've been asked to talk about the Jerusalem Declaration, which everyone signs when they come here. It's a statement, kind of confession of faith. I've actually expanded a little bit to include the Jerusalem Statement, which is, which was the, the part of the same document, because it also says some very important things. The most important, I think, being it, it says that uh, the GAFCON movement started because of three undeniable facts. And fact number one was that there is another gospel being taught in the Anglican, among Anglican churches. And I said, if it is another gospel, then, like Paul, we can just say we can't have anything to do with that, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, that, if that's true, we just can't keep walking together with good disagreement. Even if an angel or an Archbishop of Canterbury yeah. brings it to you, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd say that's, uh, that would be certainly one of my beliefs yeah. of the way we're going now. So let me ask you one final question. And uh, your, let's say you had your dream outcome for, for GAFCON in Kigali in 2023. On Friday evening, as you get on a plane and you look back and go, yes, that was about as good as it could be, what, what outcome would, would, would that have been? Well, one of the things about the first one is we said this is not uh, a moment in time, but a movement in the spirit. And I guess my hope would be that at the end of the conference there would be a, a reaffirmation of that sense that we've been present in an act of God, that the, that the Holy Spirit has been bringing us together and moving us forward. I guess that would be my, my hope and dream. Yeah. So thank you for sharing your hopes and dreams with the heart of GAFCON. It's been great to have you with us, Reverend Dr. Stephen Knoll. Thank you, David. And we'll be back very soon.